Hey there, it's time for Twip Pro Photo Critique number 26. This is Twip. Hey folks, welcome back to another Twip Pro Photo Critique session. I'm here with my good friend, Mr. Troy Miller, to step through some of the latest submissions to the Twip Pro Photo Critique topic inside the Twip Pro community. Troy Miller, man, how's it going down there? Are you, uh, you staying safe? I heard there's a California is on fire in your neck of the woods. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what is creating some amazing sunsets for me? I'm nowhere near the danger, so... You know, it's always tragic to see that happen, and and I hope everybody's okay. But you know, I got I got some nice uh, I got some nice colors. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see the priority. That's the priorities right there, right? You know, the California is on fire. Troy is like, you know, the colors are really nice right now. I really, <laughs> I, I can't I can't put the fires out. I would do that first if I could. I would help if I could, but I can't. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use I'm gonna use what I can. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. But hey, man. Uh, lots of lots of cool submissions to the community today. For, yeah, for Twenty Six. So huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got, we got to dive in. So I wanted to do something a little bit different this time. Normally, what I do is, as you know, for the last twenty five episodes or so, I would download all the images that were submitted and then send you a zip file through Dropbox, whatever. Mm -hmm. So you would have a copy of the images on your side. I have a copy on my side, and then we'd step through them. Um, I was thinking. Um, that is kind of redundant since we have this thing called the internet <laughs> and we have Twip Pro. Why am I pulling them out of Twip Pro? Why not just screen share Twip Pro and go through them? That way we also have the ability to read the comments that people leave with the images, you know, sort of the descriptions right. and all that stuff. And Stephen Scharf, one of our members, was actually, um, he suggested reading the, uh, you know, sort of the technical as posted data that people put in there with the images and he said that might be helpful so i decided to take a step further and why not just share twit pro and go yeah for it. yeah and then yeah then those who aren't part of the twit pro community can see what awesomeness awaits them if they decide to join exactly uh, my plan exactly <laughs> excellent smithers <laughs> All right, cool. So let's dive in. You want to uh, yeah. let's take a look. So I'm going to go ahead and share Twip Pro here. So we're inside of Twip Pro. Uh, for folks that don't know, what we're looking at right now is the photo critique topic within Twip Pro, as you can see at the top of the screen there. So uh, and at the you can see the members that are actually inside right now. So we got quite a few members. So come in and join us. So yep. I'm going to scroll down and find the latest submission. Okay, so here we are. It looks like the first one is from our buddy Julio Shurio. And Julio says, let me read his comment. He says, I thought, I post, I thought I'd post a photo of what I've been working on photographically for about two years now, my son Roman. Fatherhood has been amazing, requiring a ton of my time. So I decided earlier this year to take the photographer duties seriously. Got to say, it's more difficult than I imagined to capture him now that he's moving, but it's taught me a lot. I uh, I am to do most of my work in camera. I think he said he's able to do most of his work in camera. This was captured on an X Pro One with all posts done in Lightroom CC on my iPad Pro. He posted this about a week ago. So let's take a look at this shot. Look at yeah, that. fun shot. Yeah, I love it. Great timing. Great timing. You know, kids are so much fun. You know, a lot of people just want, want to kind of like pose kids and put them where they need to be and where they want them to be. And really what you need to do is you need to let kids play. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to just let them do their thing and then you have to insert yourself into their world. Um, I love the fact that he's at eye level with his son. That's also super important when you're photographing kids. Um, you know, when you're out at the park and he's running through the grass, lay on the grass, you know, get down to his level, you know. Um, but this is this is great. I, 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 I even like the flare. You know, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, I was wondering. I, I was on the fence about that. And I saw that flare down at the bottom and then I sort of trace it up to the upper right where it's coming from. And it doesn't necessarily bother me. It adds it adds to the haze of the image and sort of the spontaneity of the overall image. Right. Yeah, I mean, ideally, that that big flare in the lower left would be ideal if it wasn't there, um, and and that's just that you know moving the camera a little bit. You can see that in camera when you're shooting, mm -hmm. but in this situation, it doesn't bother me so much, and I think it's a, a cool storytelling moment, which is really you know what photographing kids are going to be about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, cool shot. 
That's a cool one. Yeah, I love that soft pastel-y color. And... I can't believe Julio's son is this old now. I remember when Val, his wife, was pregnant with, uh, with this little tax deduction. And now... <laughs> <laughs> you got to love it. You got to love it. Well, cool. Uh, so let's step on to the next shot here. Um, so we'll close out of this guy and we'll step up. So the next shot is from Craig Stamfley. Remember Craig Stamfley? And yeah. uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but he says, um, uh, I'm getting in a bit early for the next critique session, jumping in on the motorsport, motorsport bandwagon. Yeah, because a lot of people were posting on that. Um, folks that are in Twip Pro, you can go ahead and read this whole description if you want. And, and I would encourage you to, folks that are submitting, whether you're submitting a photo for Twip Pro critique or just in the show and tell area or whatever, having a little paragraph about what was going on like this just goes miles to helping us understand what you were thinking when you shot the shot. So just posting an image and giving it a title or no title, you know, you're able to do that, but having a title and or a description like this really, really helps us. So, uh, so he shot this at ISO 500, uh, 400 millimeter at F56 at 640th or 640th of a second. Um, what do you think? Let's bring it up big here. Yeah, I just opened it up. Yeah. No, I, I'm just, as, as you were talking, I was looking at it. You know, at first I thought, well, maybe we should crap out that back tire and focus in on the driver. But the driver is, is far enough forward. I think it's got good leading lines. I like the tension that's created mm -hmm. by how tight this is. And I like the tire in in the front and the back. Um, you know, the water and, and that whole thing. It looks like it looks like he's hydroplaning. You know, it looks like one it of those does, speed boats. right? Yeah, it totally does. Yeah, it definitely. Yeah. Look, yeah, now that you say that, it does look like a speedboat. It looks like he's on water. Yeah. If you can yeah. see the tires, you wouldn't you wouldn't know that this was a Formula One versus uh what do you call the the speedboats? Is it a like a crazy, insane? <laughs> uh, I don't I don't know, but the, floating the, casket. Guys, I don't know. <laughs> those guys are special. Yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. yeah they're no, good. I dig this. I I really respect this form of photography because I know it's it's you know it, it's not like you you can say oh yeah go do that again you know you kind of from what i've learned from people that shoot this they kind of position themselves in one spot and then wait for the prey to come by and then come by again and come by again yeah. and yeah. you know for a shot like this obviously he's going to be panning with this car that's flying down the track to keep it in yep. focus so you got to have your exposure right in order to be able to freeze the car and pan at the same time while capturing motion etc right yeah yeah no it's it's wonderful i i do think that it is a little bit out of focus though it looks like on the the driver like the helmet it looks like it's a little out of focus which is really 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 challenging for yeah. a car like this even as slow as it's probably moving and i say slow because if he was in water during the race, he slowed down. But if it was during a normal race, they're even faster. They're hard to track. Yeah. So, but what? It's such a great shot. Yeah. I, wait, I really wait, don't I have a lot if, to add. I wonder if this image would be like even with the out of focusness of the of the driver, would it still be saleable? You know. Of course. And, yeah. 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 Like like if you if this was going to go in a magazine, would they care that it's slightly soft, or would they just say, you know what? This is not perfect technically. So focus is on. a is a technical aspect of photography, but it's not necessary for an image to be successful all the time. And absolute focus doesn't necessarily have to happen all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, being a wedding photographer, there are times that my images are acceptably sharp, but are they perfectly sharp? No. Mm -hmm. But it's what's what's acceptable for the image and the use of that image. Um, so it's really more about the moment and the personality you've captured in the frame. And then, you know, um, you know what I, as, as I, as I reduce this image down now, I, I get it. That white line at the top was kind of freaking me out. I'm like, is that the way it's being displayed on my monitor? Um, but I see that that's probably a line in the road. So I might crop that line out mm -hmm. on the top, right? Yeah. Would you crop it out or would you clone it out? <sighs> or content aware fill it out? I would I would play with it. <laughs> I'd play with but it. I, yeah, yeah. I would make the line go away. I think it's I think it's uh, it's odd, especially on a white background. It feels like like the image is broken. Yeah, yeah. But good, but cool shot, right? Love it. Yeah, that's great. Love it. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Craig Stampley, for uh, for that shot. Let's move on to the next one here. 
and this one is from Andy S. She calls this one uh, the last baby shoe <laughs> the image. This is number three. Let's bring that up big. Look at that. Yeah, she's been submitting these baby shoe images, and she, we had a little. Remember, yeah. we, we all had a little dialogue about it, and yeah. uh, she decided to push it forward a little bit and and put her uh, her special Andy seasoning sauce on this one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do you What yeah. do you think of this one? I dig the shot. Um, you know, the, the there's a the lot going on here. There's a lot going on. The texture is really sort of holding me back. I feel like instead of adding to the to the image, I feel like it's too much, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not natural in the way that it's applied um, in the sense that if it was an old degrading photograph, you know, it would be different. This is a texture that's layered on top of it and then probably erased. So just the texture isn't my favorite, but I love the, the composition of the, of the shoes and the tonality and the mirror, you know, I, I just dig the whole story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. The only, only comment I had on this one was, yeah, the, I like having a little bit of texture on there, but there's a fine line between it sort of taking over a little bit. I don't think it's quite taking over on this one, but I notice it too much. Like I don't, like a texture, I don't feel like I should notice it. It should just be part of the image rather than right. rather than another element within the image. So, but again, right. you know, these kinds of artistic interpretations are 100% subjective, right? So this absolutely. Is, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So cool. I'm glad she's, I'm glad she's taken this and, and turned it into a little bit of a project. That's good. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. These, these shoes have stories behind them, man. It's, that's crazy. And look at look at the wear on the toe of that show that shoe that's yeah. you know on the on the right there on camera right yeah no, that's camera left yeah on camera left that is uh, those shoes have definitely been worn and and probably have lots of stories and you know DNA and vomit on them and you know, <laughs> <laughs> those are some kid nice wore visual. those yeah you know you know cool all right Andy S rocking it thank you. All right, let's move on to the next one. Next one is another one from Andy S. Look at this one. So this is St. Andrews. She says she's never gone inside, only taken pictures from the outside. Check that out. Look at that. Yeah, nice uh, nice architectural photo. Well balanced, nice vertical lines. <clears throat> I like it. I like that somebody's sitting in there. Yep, breaking the symmetry. Yep. Yep, breaking the symmetry a little bit. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I like it. It's a good classical interior, well done, you know, vertical lines, it, you know, it's handled very well. It's, it's, you know, admittedly, it's not a exciting subject, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but it's a great interior shot and handled technically handled very well. Yeah. It's very respectful of, of a church shot. It's very symmetrical. And I mean, I would imagine that the architects of this particular structure, you know, obviously had symmetry in mind when they <clears throat> when they put this place together. Yeah. So capturing that is beautiful. This church looks flawless, and you've got uh, a parishioner sitting right there, just you know, praying. Yep. Which is, I think, that makes to me that makes the shot. Otherwise, it's just another architectural shot. But when you right. look, when you look at it, and you see there's actually a human element using the facility, then it it adds another dimension to it so sure and this could be a photojournalism type image as opposed to just an architectural image because you've got a person in there and you're kind of telling that story yeah which no. is really great yeah it's really great absolutely yeah this makes me feel like a wedding <laughs> that's my view that's my view when a church at a wedding all the time oh that's right yeah that's yeah right. yeah usually the, the bride and groom and the wedding party are up there and everybody's yep. in there that's where I've lived the last 25 years. And, and you're you're sitting there not using flash, of course, right? <laughs> so. No. Oh, no, gosh, no. Love it. Love it. Cool. All right. So let's move on to the next image here. Very cool. Andy S. rocking the house here. Um, There's a new member, Aroxo Pichel. I hope I'm getting your name right, Aroxo. So... This is, Aroxo says, this is my first submission for critique ever here or anywhere else. I tend oh, to like, yay. yeah, look at that. Awesome. I tend to like shallow depth of field images and low color count images. So I think this is influential in my images. Yeah, I agree. I like shallow depth of field as well. So let's pull this oh, up yeah. on the screen. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, I dig it. Um yeah, well, you know, right away when I saw this, it was very abstract, mm -hmm. and I love shallow depth of field. I mean, my favorite lens at a wedding is an 85-1.4, and I shoot it at 1.4 yeah. all day. 
Life just uh, looks better at shallow depth of field. Right, right. Because right. who needs to see the background? No, no, <laughs> no. I'm happy my eyes are deteriorating. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my only suggestion for this image would be I, I wish that the the depth of field wasn't like in the middle, like where the focus is. I wish it was more like front one third type of thing. So there wasn't so much blur in the foreground, because if I if I cropped off, say, the bottom 30 percent or so, to me, that feels better um, because the front the, the front of the image is so or we'll call it the bottom of the image is so out of focus and so soft. There's really nothing to look at there. Yeah, um, I would love to have seen that cropped up a little bit. Maybe make the image square, but as we've said before, super subjective. Yeah. Um, you know what I like about? The, I agree with you. Yeah, if the depth of field was slightly closer to the camera, it would it would capture your eye quicker as to you right, know, what right. you're looking at. Um, as it is now, which is fine. Like you said, subjective. You have to, your eye has to travel into the image a little bit in order to get to the good stuff. The this good tack sharp stuff right um, the jelly filling yeah yeah the cool the cool thing that i like about this image is it reminds me of of a insect's eye view so yeah you know rather than just a, yet another shot um you know the the artist is experimenting with different points of view and different perspectives as well as incorporating shallow depth of field and and his color treatment so bravo yeah. Probably. Yeah, I like it. Um, if possible, you know, get rid of that that highlight, that spectral highlight over there on the left, because mm -hmm. um, it's going to draw your eye. And then the bright spot on the top right, it's the same thing. If you were to get rid of those, and even if you just did sort of a sloppy clone just to see what it looked like, you'd see how immediately your eye would only go for the sharp spot. Those other bright spots your eyes would never look at. Mm -hmm. um, but as it is, you've got this competition between these bright spots and the sharp area in the middle, and your eyes, you, your brain's just going to get tired. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah you you're, you're right. Your eye, your eye automatically goes to the brightest part of the image, and those mm -hmm. are the two brightest parts, which are not the subject of the image. So, right, right. Yeah, good, good comments. Cool. All right, let's move on. Thank you. Uh, Iraxo. That's a cool name, by the way, too. I like that. Yeah, that is. A... <laughs> I'm uh, glad you tried to pronounce it because I, I thought I would. <laughs> I know I probably butchered it. So you're going to have to. Iraxo, if, you're going to have to give us a, uh, a phonetic spelling of your name in, uh, in the comments for that image later. Right. All right. The next one up is from Gavin Steiner. And Gavin says, this is titled, Oh, Really? Uh, she was way across a four-lane street and suddenly turned around to look at herself. If you look closely, you can see that she sees me as well. Camera was a Canon EOS Rebel T6i. The lens was a EF 40 millimeter f2.8. Um, it was shot wide open at 320th of a second f2.8 ISO 800. And he shot this in Barrie, Canada. Look at that. All right. Very cool. Very cool street photo. Mm -hmm. I like it. I, I think that... Uh, this this would look good in black and white. I think that this is one of those images that you know it could be it could benefit from black and white. The the only other comment that I have, I mean, I love the composition. Um, I love the storytelling of this. It's not sharp. She's yeah, not I was going to say that. Yeah, it's yeah. not sharp. Yeah, yeah, the wall's sharp. Um, yeah, even the critical. wall the wall isn't that sharp either. You know, it is. It's it's a little right. bit off. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole thing. I love the composition. I love the idea. I love the the sort of spot action street photo nature of this you know that was just unexpected and which you know i appreciate it's hard to get a shot like that but yeah it's it's slightly soft so i would have loved to have seen this in sharp and i agree with you yeah so like we always say if color's not adding to the image let's see mm -hmm. what it looks like without that color in there i think this one as it's already contrasty you know with the with the, right. with the mirror being bright at the top and then her being dark at the bottom so it's already a contrasty image. So just doing a black and white treatment on this might lend to draw attention into the subject a little bit more. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Very cool. All right. Look at that. A lot of activity in Twit Pro. What's going on, man? Yeah. What is happening? All right. Craig Stampley, our good friend. All right. He says he's trying out a new lens that he purchased recently. This is of the Curlipa bridge connecting brisbane cbd to south bank this was shot at iso 100 on a 15 millimeter f 2.8 at a sixth of a second brisbane australia Look at that. yeah this is so cool 
Yeah, this is. This looks like a spaceship landing, doesn't it? Yeah, th you know, this is this is a perfect example of why, why black and white can work so well. I mean, all these graphical elements and stuff that are in here. This is this is awesome. I wish we had stars, uh, mm. but that that probably would be hard to do unless it was a perfectly clear, bright, you know, bright night. Mm -hmm. But uh, graphically, it's awesome, and I like the people in there. And it looks like this uh, blurry subject in the front right is is like lifting his hand up to take a picture with his yeah, phone or something I that too yeah 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 i agree yeah if this is if he had the milky way in here this would be <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing greg come on man put the, mil the, the milky way in there flying through there yeah. yeah yeah or a moon or something no but i actually like it i'm i'm joking obviously i like it with the stark dark sky because it it is nice yeah, yeah it, it, is it, nice. it it makes the graphic Gra the graphical element of that that roof structure stand out more and it kind of draws you into the image to see like what's going on in there you know what's the, what are those people doing where are they going oh that's yeah. a city look in the background i see buildings you know so it kind of pulls you into the image so. yeah even so much so i would i would clean up the the black areas in the middle you know on the right the right open area you got a little it'll light uh yeah dots in there and then on the left i know there's a, a building there but there's like a triangular piece that's kind of sticking out that i mean you know just cleaning up some of those distractions might not be a bad idea but as it is i love that where, where do you style. where do you fall on doing those sorts of cleanup techniques on something that is is technically street photography you think that's okay or like well it's it, if you're selling it as photojournalism no but if right. you're selling it as art Yes. Right, I mean, like right. I would take the security. So, so for me, okay. So for me, because I like to edit my images a lot and cause I want to tell the full story the way I saw it, I would fix the light that's out in the ground. I would fix that. Mm -hmm. Um, I would, you know, and then I would, I would get rid of the security cameras. Um, I would clean up the ground. I, you know, in the sky, I would get rid of any little tiny micro distraction, um, yeah. and fix everything I can because, that's the story that I want to tell. But that becomes art, not photojournalism. Right. So it depends right. on how you're going to present it. Yeah. Yeah. And if he was going to present this in a gallery, for example, of, of like images, mm -hmm. would that like, is that artistic or is it photojournalism or does it matter how you promote it? Like if these are, these are the photographic, the photojournalistic works of Craig Stanfley versus these are the artistic works of Craig Stanfley. Right. I think that, that I think that's it though. I think maybe that's the perception is if you say it's photojournalism, the perception is that you didn't manipulate the image and build it. Right. Or you didn't change it. But if it's just presented as, oh, these are the works of Craig Stanfley, we, we may not know. Mm -hmm. Or if it's just the art, because there's a lot like I go to a lot of galleries and look and I look for that, you know, like it, it, do they classify this as photojournalism? Then I expect what's in the image to be what was there. Yeah. Right. If there was a piece of trash, I expect that to be there. But if it's art, um, then if there's trash there, I expect them to have left it because it's intentional in the image. Right. Right. Like it tells part of the story. Right. Because to me, art is interpretive. And, you know, I want to see things fixed a certain way because an image like this, I want to see the graphical elements. I don't want to see that the light is out on the ground. Yeah. You and, know? and in the end, it's just two ways of of expressing art. Right. So leaving oh, yeah. like leaving everything in the scene is part of the art itself. You know, there's a could be yeah, there's a trash bag in the foreground. That's part of it. Yep. Right. That's yep. part of yeah. what was there. And it's part of the overall scene. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's all up to the artist, because mm -hmm. for me, I wouldn't want to see the trash bag. Right. Because right. then that makes me think of messy humans. You're right. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And you know, those but, humans. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, imperfection, imperfection is art as well. So uh, it's abstraction. Yeah. Abstraction. Love it. Cool, Craig Stanfley, thank you for that submission. All right, moving on. Next one, another one from Craig, look at that. So Craig says, one more to add to the fray, I had a busy week and the highlight was attending a Canon event this morning at a local racetrack. Everything uh, from a 70 to 200, uh, from 70 to 200 S, 70 to 200. Um, to a couple whopping 600 millimeter f4 were available to try and use. Oh, from 7200 millimeter lenses, is what he's saying. Um, for this image, I use my 5D3 and Canon 400 millimeter at f2.8 shutter speed. It was one four thousandths of a second, um, purely to freeze the car head on for a nice shallow depth of field. Other images were at slower shutter speeds to capture some motion. However, I like the simplicity of this one. Let's take a look. Yeah. 
Yeah, I dig it. No, look it's, at that. it's it looks miniature when I look at it big. Yeah. It looks like a it looks like a tilt shift shot almost. Yeah, just about. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's beautiful with his GoPro up there too. Look, look. That's how sharp it is. You can see there's a GoPro on the roll bar. Yeah. Yep, an old style GoPro too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which still work great, which means that's why GoPro is struggling right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because these cars that you get these cameras that you strap to race cars still work perfectly fine, so why buy a new one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that is crazy. That's, that is cool though. Yeah, yeah. and no, looking I, at that, I, I wonder how fast he was moving because like he froze it. Like looking at these images versus that other Formula 1 image we were looking at. Yeah, I like both of them, but I like to see a little bit of motion in these because I don't know if that car was just parked right there, right? Yeah, it's hard to tell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard to tell. But it's such a great, I mean, such a great compositional uh, image. I mean, I, as I'm looking at it, I'm kind of struggling with whether or not, you know, we need to crop the top, you no, know, below I like those that. lines. It's just, to me, it yeah. shows where it was, where this car was. Like it's, I know, it's zigzagged, I, and now it's there at the bottom lower in the in that uh, in that rule of thirds area on the bottom right now. You know? See, but those two horizontal uh, black lines, we'll call them, in the top. Oh, at the very top, yeah. Just below the second one, so you still see the triangle. Mm-hmm. I like the triangles, right? So you got that that one triangle that that you know it, it pinches off on the left, and then then you got the grass and then you got the other this is tough for me but i love those graphical elements in the top half of the frame as well yeah yeah no i would play with cropping it but other than that there's there's really not a whole lot to add i mean it's sharp it's good composition yeah yeah Yeah. i think he should buy that lens i think that he should own that lens yeah that is that is (laughs) that is a cracking lens i can even see the I I think that's a carbon fiber pattern on that leading edge of the car you see down by the uh-huh. road. Like if you could see that level of detail after this oh. has been compressed and uploaded and you know Mighty Networks compresses things when you upload them anyway. Yep. So you still have all that detail in the shot. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I zoomed in on it. Yeah, it's it's definitely you can see the pattern in the carbon fiber for yep. sure. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Good shot, man. Yeah. Good shot, Craig. Very cool. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, Matthew Moore. So Matthew Moore says, Shadows on the pier taking on a Sony A7 with a Helios 44.2. Focal length was 55 millimeter. He thinks he shot at F, well, F2, I think, manual lens, no XF. Um, ISO 3200, shutter was 150th, heavily processed in Lightroom. Let's take a look. Look at that. Yeah, I like this. Yeah, I dig this. Mm-hmm. Look at that I shadow. Love That's crazy. Yeah, and 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 notice this: the wreath and some of the Christmas canes and the lights uh-huh. on the left. Yeah. Yeah. Even in like in color, you'd be able to see the red and white of the Christmas canes and the green and the red and the wreath, obviously. But I like the fact that they're there and they make you think. Right. So now I'm looking up there and I see those. Oh, those are candy canes. Those are supposed to be red and white. Interesting. So there's a wreath. Okay, so that's probably green. Right. So it makes you think of that. And then it also leads me in and up the stairs. And then I see that shadow, which is probably moving up the stairs. Right. Or going to go up the stairs, whoever that whoever's casting that shadow. But then, it, then it gets me like there's so many elements in here. Then it gets me because I'm like, who's casting that shadow and where are they? You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's a cool shot. Yeah. I, I was going to I was seeing the same thing. I, I, I would probably burn down the highlights uh, on the left half of the frame, like um, just to the left of the stairs mm-hmm. and up in that top left hand corner so that the brightest spot in the image would be the stairs, the opening mm. of that doorway in those stairs. Because I think that's, you know, your eyes look at that and you wonder what's up there. The shadows look like they're walking to the stairs. Yeah. So there's that, that whole mystery element that's going on there. What about that? Like we talked about that in one of the previous images, those two pieces of trash on the ground in the foreground. I have to take those out. You would take those out, right? <laughs> I yeah. have to. Yeah, they yeah. try. The me anal nuts. retentive Troy Miller yeah, would be I like, can't. oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would. You know, it's just one out. click of a clone stamp tool or a healing brush, right? <laughs> I would take out most of the stuff that's on the ground. Yeah. Anything? Yeah. Any other elements you take out, like the whatever that uh-huh. warning sign is on the left? Would you take that out? No, but but on the right hand side above the door on the right, that little bright 
plate, I would take that out. Anything uh-huh. that's specular, that's going to draw your eye away yeah. from what I want you to look at. And for me, I would want you to look at the stairway. I would, I would tune those things up or burn them down. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. Cool. Good shot though, huh? Yeah. Very cool. Very cool street shot. I like that. All right. Matthew Moore. Good job. All right. Let's get out of that one. Thank you, Matthew Moore in Merced, California. Let's close that off, and let's look at the next one. Tim Engel posted yesterday. Look at this. Tim is a man of few words, so no title, no description. <laughs> he is like, here you go. <laughs> yeah, he just walks in, throws it on the table. There, there you go. Uh huh. Yeah, nothing. Just here's here here's some pixels. You figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I dig it. He always has such such cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the color of the background, the the look on the model's face. I love the the harsh lighting. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know her eyelashes are making those those lines, the shadows. I dig all that. Yep. Um, my only suggestion would be to burn down the bright spot that would be camera left. You know, on her chest, under her arm, is is a little bit too bright, and I feel like it's distracting from her face. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I mean, you know, maybe maybe on her ear a little bit or, you know, some dodging and burning just kind of bring focus in. But yeah. other than that, it's great. Um, it's Tim Engel, classic Tim Engel. You know, yeah. the the one thing if I had to criticize this image, which I, I don't feel qualified to criti- criticize this image. It's it's awesome. But the um, the little triangle of an arm in the upper right hand corner. Yeah. Showing. So that that is distracting. I know what it is because I can see what her arm is doing at the shoulder down there. But I'm on the fence of if, would I just take that out completely or does it work to sort of frame the image in a little bit? You know? No, I, I, I see that as a trap, as, a, as sort of a little light trap, because it's it's bright enough that you want to look at it. And if you notice when you're looking at this image, your eye hits that corner a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, again, it's about removing distractions. I would take that out. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, good work, Tim Engel. Thank you for submitting. Yeah, I like the colors in there. It's good. Yeah, Tim's been playing around with those gels, man. He's in the he's in that gel world. Love it. All right. Let's move on. Stephen Scharf. Look at this one. So this is a Ferrari a Ferrari F12 Berlinetta. Um, editorial automotive he categorizes it as and this is this is shot with a Fujifilm X-T1 with an 18 to 55 millimeter lens at f8 1 220th of a second at ISO 200 available light only one frame exposure no high dynamic range <laughs> you want to make sure like we do that. that yeah and no put that in there <laughs> I got this in one shot one frame <laughs> neener neener <laughs> yep uh, and this is at Sonoma Raceway in uh, in California. Look at that. Yeah. Let's bring that up. Look at that car. I need that in my life. <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a great shot. It's it's really cool. I like yeah. the I like the crop. I like it in the lower thirds. I like the background. That's mm-hmm. so well done. Yeah, this is a car magazine shot, isn't it? Yeah, this is good. I I, I would. I would say that that some dodging and burning on the car uh, could be helpful to bring up some more contrast and punch in the in the car because you know we're looking at the shadow side of the car. Mm-hmm. So I mean, if you want us to see the background and all of that, you know, as well, but it's brighter than the car. So some dodging and burning there may help. And then there's just a couple spots in the car that I would take out um, in the front, uh, in front and behind the front tire. There's it looks like the, a person. You know, it's like a like they're wearing a white shirt or something. Uh huh. Yeah. I would probably take those out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So little things like that, like zoom in and sort of walk the image and and. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 again, I mean, that's not a lot. It's it's only the um, the background being so much brighter than the foreground or the the, the face of the car we're looking at mm-hmm. tends to draw my eye away. But that's subjective to what you want the viewer to look at. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But nicely done. I mean, it's sharp front to back. You know, that's that's handled really well. So Fuji cameras, man, I wonder how much post-processing he did on this or, you know, in other words, how much of this is Fuji? How much of this is um, Steven? Interesting. We'll have to. Well, Steven, you'll have to tell us in the uh, the comments for this image how much post-processing you did on this, because I'm I'm particularly curious right now because I'm looking at Fuji cameras um, to sort of, 
you know, looking at larger sensor cameras to add to my repertoire of image making gear. And uh, I keep hearing Fuji people talk about that Fuji look and Fuji color and all that stuff. So is this an example of Fuji color or not? So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that just that just kind of cracks me up because the the Fuji the Fuji color and the Fuji look is some engineer that decided to process the raw data that way. Right. 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 Exactly. I mean, you know, you can do that, too. Yeah. 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 That's why I always, I always think about that. Like when people say like the Fuji look or, you know, that Hasselblad look or the um, what's the other Leica look. That was the other one. The Leica look. You know, I like Leica cameras because they have that particular look. <laughs> I don't know if it's me, but I still haven't been able to figure out what that look is, you know, because it's all raw data, you know. So I, yeah, I yeah. would love a conversation inside Twip Pro about these different, quote, looks from Fuji and from Leica and from Hasselblad and et cetera, that, that make the people that use those particular bodies love them so much, right? And if, are those looks repeatable in software, you know, or in post-processing? So I don't know. All right, so let's move on to the next one here. Uh, da, 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 da. Just so you know, I, I, bit my, I bit my tongue to answer any of that. <laughs> Why? Because it'd be a long conversation. <laughs> Why? Well, well, I mean, well, we give, me, that give me the Reader's Digest version of that conversation. Like, do you uh, believe there's a look, or do you not? It's all post. It? It's all post. It's some engineer sat down and said, "We're gonna, we're gonna take the data on this chip, and we're gonna interpret it this way, so that when you look at it in camera or you look at it in the computer, that's what we want you to see based on what that chip is capable of capturing." Right. So can Lightroom or Capture One or other post processes get close? I'm sure they can get really close. Can they get exactly? Probably not, but they can get really close. So when you talk about a look, um, you know, hopefully that's a style that, that Fuji has, has pushed you towards and a look that they said, hey, look, this is what we want to give you. And you've adopted that because you like that. Because you like that look. So you think, do you think a lot of that sort of look talk and speak is marketing and yeah yeah i wonder yeah so you're gonna I do. I do. you're I sparking think. a firestorm because i know i know those fuji right shooters <laughs> are gonna come out you know with their tiki torches man i'm telling you i know <laughs> i know i get i get it i get it but you know give me a raw file and i'll make it look you know just the same it's just it's it's all raw data all right hey fuji people uh <laughs> Mr. Miller here has thrown the gauntlet down, saying that uh, you are suffering from you no know, Fuji Fuji color derangement syndrome. Oh. <laughs> okay, everybody no. knows I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, I heard it. I don't know. Didn't you guys hear it? I heard it. He said, uh, uh, <laughs> "Crap! Here comes it. Here comes." <laughs> like I said, Tichi, do it. Like you're like Frankenstein hiding in the castle now. <laughs> Oh, man. Cool. All right. Let's move on to the next one here. We're having too much fun. All right. So the next one is oh, yeah, another one from Stephen. Look at this one. All right. So Stephen, uh, this is Scottish Sea Eagle. A Scottish Sea Eagle is released by its falconer during a flying demonstration at Gauntlet Birds of Prey Raptor Sanctuary in Nunsford, UK. This was shot at a Fujifilm X100T. Oh, the little one. Nice. Handheld panning shot at eight frames per second in continuous high speed autofocus mode at one eight hundredth of a second. F4 ISO 1600 black and white conversion by Fujifilm monochrome profile <laughs> applied in Lightroom. Ah, <laughs> what do you say about this, Mr. <laughs> Derangement Syndrome? <laughs> I, I got nothing to add. I got no. <laughs> No, no. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's you know what? This is this is so cool because my favorite part of this is the fact that the the falcon, or I don't know what kind of bird it is, if he's a falcon here, but a falcon, his face, the the bird's face is in focus, the mm -hmm. beak is in focus, the eyes, and then the shoulders, and then it sort of falls off yeah. behind that. So yep. that is that is just such an amazing element of this. Um I, I, I would crop the left side a little bit so that it feels balanced to me, but mm -hmm. may, maybe not because it feels like the bird's flying away. I just wish there was some more space around the bird. I could see this as a bigger image with this these elements smaller. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. So there's more 
more sky for the bird to fly off into. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with the cropping in on the left side of the frame a little bit as well, too, because it's already you, you when you look when I look at this image, I think symmetry, you know, because the 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 falcon is symmetrical with its wings for the most part. And then the falconer yeah. at the bottom is relatively centered. Um, but yeah, moving it into the middle. And yes, I 100 percent agree if I had a little bit more space in there for the falcon to fly into. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's we're nitpicking, obviously. But to, but, you know, in terms of the processing, I really like the grain structure in here, too. Yeah, I really like that. It really adds to it. Like people like especially if you grew up shooting with film, you know, grain is evil and it is a necessary evil in order to get an image. Right. It used to be like, well, if you yep. if you want to shoot in that dark room, you're going to have to use thirty two hundred and that's going to have golf ball sized <laughs> grain. You know, <laughs> so. yeah. So let me give you my nitpick on grain. Uh oh. Um, having been a, having been a film shooter, you are just grain... nonconformist today, aren't you? <laughs> no. Grain grain doesn't exist in the whites because there's no silver halide there. So like in this image at the bottom of the image, there's a lot of grain in the highlight area, right? Well, if this was shot on film, and of course it's not, but but if we're going to talk film, there would be no grain there. Oh. So the grain is not. There's less grain in the highlights than there is in the shadows. Mm, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So that's just me being, you know, a uh, a purist when it comes to film and grain. Well, that, if you want, that also presupposes that the look that you're trying to get to is simulating film, right? So, right, but, if, but if you're going to call it grain, then that's that's sort of suggesting film. Otherwise, it's noise. It's noise. Yeah. Nice. Look at you getting on your. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take to climb up onto that high horse every day? <laughs> oh, that's not true. Oh. Okay. Do you have a step stool? I mean, like, how do you get up there, man? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's cool. I love it. This is all a great my, shot. All though. my friends are gonna love this episode the best because because <laughs> I'm getting shredded right now. <laughs> hey, you're shredding yourself. You are sticking your hand personally in the garbage disposal. That's what's happening. No, no, no. Because that if, if that would be the case, then you then you would be suggesting that things I'm saying is are wrong. Yeah, that's true. and I'm suggesting that they're not. You and you are right. You are right. You're right. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you a chance to redeem yourself on this next oh. image. Uh, this is from Henry Hinzey. Uh Henry is from Little Falls, New York. He uploaded this about eight hours ago. And uh, look at this. He says this is uh, Chit Chittenago Falls in Chittenago, New York. Look at that, long exposure. This is a this is a cool falls. I like this. It is. I see a little bit of motion blur in areas that should be sharp, like the rocks. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's from camera shake or maybe the wind was blowing or something, but those rocks should be a little bit sharper. Other than that, I love the length of this exposure. I wish he had put that in there. Um, like, the, what do you think? How long do you think this exposure was? Maybe 10 seconds? Yeah, I was going to say 10 to 30. I mean, that water is probably moving pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So this is this is the kind of image, though, that time of day is going to be critical for uh, getting the best image out of this subject. Yeah. And, you know, this is this is pseudo backlit, like the sun is behind the subject on camera left. And so this would be something that whatever time of day this is, you want to be here at the opposite time, like 12 hours earlier or later so that that sun is filling this from an angle, Yeah, you know, so that water is really lit. And then like you mentioned, the, some of the rocks are soft. Most of the rocks are soft. Mm -hmm. So that means that the camera moved or it's out of focus. Right. And that's what a long exposure does is because those are soft. Everything else is, is super sharp. There's that contrast. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, this is, this is a subject you could shoot a lot. This is really cool. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I know you're thinking, a model up there on that ridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, because there's a there's a spot right there. It, yeah, you just climb yeah. right on up there. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. down at the bottom on that flat angular rock on the right side, right? Yeah. I would crop up from the bottom a little bit. That foreground is bright and we don't really need that. Um Yeah. You know but, what I was uh, I was thinking about this when I look at this image, I I was thinking one of my latest obsessions has been data and particularly learning the ins and outs of the photo pills app mm -hmm. and when i see shots like this or scenes like this my brain now and i'm happy this is happening my brain goes from 
wow, they really picked a good time to shoot this too. If I was there, I would, and I saw the scene, now I would grab photo pills and look right. at when the sun is going to be in the right spot so I could take some notes and plan on when I'm going to come back there to to capture the image. And I love, right. I love that new way of thinking now, you know, yep. that, that I'm starting to think of is like for these kind of shots, instead of relying on serendipity and happenstance, it's now planning and execution you know it's kind of cool yeah welcome to the world of professional photography you know it's fun it's <laughs> yeah, fun it who knew <laughs> now those tools are so so cool yeah and before we leave this one my only other suggestion would be black and white oh yeah i'd love right? to see a black and white conversion of this, this. would yeah. be yep yep push no. the clarity a little bit if you're in lightroom the and that might help the softness of the rocks as well right yep yeah, it'll help a lot. Yeah, it's really yeah, nice. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, who was the artist on this one? Uh, Henry or Harry Henze. Yeah, Harry, Harry, if you can do a black and white conversion of this and upload it to the comments for this image, we'd love to take a look at that. Very cool. It's so cool having a nice community like this where you can, you know, yeah. interact with the members and and feel safe and feel safe and not feel like, you know, Cambridge Analytica is tracking your every move. Uh, let's move on into this one. This is from our friend Kyle Nishioka. Kyle says, these are models Jessica, Jill, and Ashley. I've worked with these models a few times in the past, and I've counted on them for locations in Vegas for interesting shoots. This one was at an abandoned cement plant near the giant gear in the background. It's from some uh, decaying piece of machinery. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. need to know where that is, because I'm close to Vegas. I want to go shoot there. Yeah, that is nice. That is a cool. That set. is really cool. Yeah, yeah is, I love I that. I didn't even notice the gear. I don't know why I was distracted. I didn't even notice the gear initially. <laughs> <laughs> you noticed the boots. That's what you were. It was the at. boots. Noticed no, the boots. it was the graffiti on the wall, the bottom right. Yeah, there was this. No, beautiful women, beautiful girls, good shot. Um, yeah, yeah. This is you know I love what I love about Kyle's work is Kyle's not afraid to to stretch and because we've seen. We've seen architectural work from him. We've seen mm -hmm. landscape. We've seen model work. And, you know, he's not afraid to play around. And we talk about this on This Week in Photo a lot, where when you're trying to find your genre of photography and what your look and feel and style is, kind of what Julio is teaching in his Finding the Photographer's Vision course. Um, the best way and probably the only way to do that is to contest is to shoot all the time yep. and try out different things you know yep you gotta yep. you, you gotta, gotta date you gotta date different genres to find out the one that you're gonna marry right yeah yeah oh you do no you do and then and then you know my thing is is like try to go narrow and deep in in a subject and really really learn it and that way you can get the nuances of that subject and how you move like i photograph people all the time so for me when i look at shots like this i see all of the things that i would correct if i was photographing people mm -hmm. because i shoot i photograph people all the time yeah so, so for example, the model on the right in the purple, I can see her left hand sticking out of her abdomen, right? That's something I would see in camera. I would say, hey, let's pull that left hand back. Or the model in, in, the, in the black outfit on the far left, I can see her left arm as she's trying to wrap it around. But that elbow looks completely odd sticking out of the left side of her back It area. does, yeah. Yep. 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 And then the model in the very, very center, her right hand is on her hair just above the model in the black. And coming right? out of so, her head, right? Yeah, so, you know, shooting models more and shooting people more as you're photographing, you'd be like, oh, hey, I don't know everybody's name, right? You'd be like, okay, so, Ashley, I need you to pull that left hand back a little bit. Um, Jessica, that right, that left hand, let's have you hide that. And then Jill, you know, pull that right hand down a little bit. As I'm talking, I'm shooting. And that would help you narrow this down and get that pose even even tighter. Yeah, yeah. Very nice, but cool do you, job. Do you think Do you think this shot uh, would be better served in black and white, or or is color good for this one? The only reason that I would say black and white is I is I wish that I'm going to call it Ashley because that's the person on the far right. I'm going to say I wish that she was in black. Yeah. So that the, yeah. the tones the tones would match because I I would totally dig the fact that they were all in black. The you got that tan background and you got this red graffiti. Right. Basically a very not quite monochromatic, but, you know, tritone kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think black and white could be cool. Yeah. Very nice. Good shot. Yeah. And, the, and how do you feel about the border? We talked about this a little bit before, but adding a border 
to an image? Do you think that adds like to it or takes away? I think it adds. I, I do because it feels finished to me, and maybe that's just more old school for me, mm -hmm. um, coming from print. But I, I do like that it's that it's finished that way, and I like that his logo, his his name, his watermark is in the border, not on the image. Yeah, yeah. And Julio Shorio has me thinking about that still too, to watermark or to not watermark images. Where 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 did you net on that? Are you are you a watermarker? I'm a non-watermarker, um, if I can help it. It, de it depends. So if it's going to my clients, if it's like a gallery for clientele or something, I don't watermark because I don't want that to get in the way. If I'm if I'm sharing something like on Twit Pro or Instagram or social media where I want somebody to be able to go, hey, whose photo is this? Then I'll watermark it. I'm not watermarking to protect it from thievery. Yeah. I'm watermarking it to let you know who I am. Yeah, love it. That's, that's a that's good really nuance. That is a good nuance, yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you, Kyle Nishioka, for that shot. We're almost. Yeah, he was in. He was in Vegas, and you know, next time he goes to Vegas, he needs to let us know because we're close to Vegas. Right. I know. Come on, Kyle. Kyle's all over the place. He is. He is all over in a good way. All right, let's move up to the next image here. This one is from Gavin Steiner. Gavin says, I love taking street photos as I'm driving through the city. This is another one out the window as I was driving by. I am looking at the road, so I have to get my timing right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was going to I was gonna ask. I'm glad he added that part. <laughs> That's so awesome. I can see him driving down the road with his camera hanging out the window, one eye forward and one eye out. You know, I wonder if they could get you for that, because they could get you for you using your cell phone but can they get you for using your camera anything that's distracting your ability to drive i think they can nail you for yeah it. yeah uh, but there are no laws like they're in california there are no cell phone use while driving laws explicit laws but you know but yeah you're right he says uh, i'm looking at the road so i have to get my timing right and many don't come out as I picture them. Sometimes they come out better. Sometimes they fail. Smiley face. This is called Sun Shower. The camera was a Canon EOS Rebel T6i. The lens was an EF S24 millimeter F2.8 STM. I don't even know what STM means in the Canon world. Um, and he shot this at 24 millimeter aperture priority um, uh, at one one fortieth of a second F8 at ISO 100. Do you know what do you know what STM means in nope. canon parlance yeah canon shooters you got to let us know what, what does that mean because uh troy is a um troy you shoot what pentax right <laughs> <laughs> i shoot nikon i know you yeah and i supplement the nikon awesomeness with sony yes yes i know which is a winning formula for you right yeah 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 all right well i got the shot up big what do you what do you think of this one I dig it. I, I really do. And, you know, if we label this street photography or fine art or those kind of things, then all the the motion and the blur and the not tack sharp spot, that's OK, mm -hmm. because this is more of a, of a storytelling element. The blurry pole in the foreground is super cool. Yeah. I, I dig that. I really do. If if this were mine, I would clone out the sign on the side of the building in front of where the woman's walking. Oh, because it makes you it, it makes you frustrated, right? Because you're like, yeah, I want to read it, but I can't read it. What does it say? Where is she going? Ah. Right. I just think that it's I just think that it's distracting. And if you look at history of some of the great photographers, whether it's street photographers or landscape or whatever, um, there's a lot of minimalism in the image. There's a lot of intentional. So the things that you see are meant to be there. The things that aren't, you know, they've made an effort to to get rid of. Um, you know, you could crop this one from the top all the way down below those words if you wanted to and then and then the impact is still there and it's more focused on the subject walking yeah so those kind of things for me are what i look at in my imagery is to get rid of any distractions that don't add to the image simple less is more less is definitely more yeah and if you look at some of your favorite images you'll notice that there is intentional minimalism in those images. Even if it's full of stuff, mm -hmm. each thing is exactly what it's supposed to be. Yeah. You know what's interesting about this image is, you know, in if in, in photography school they teach you, and I guess I would imagine cinematography school as well, but that your subject should be walking into the frame. They should never be walking out of the frame like this one. Like she's exiting the frame. Um, I like this exiting the frame. 
this it, it oh yeah yeah it adds tension it, she's leaving me she's walking away i don't know where she's going it adds that element of mystery i don't know what she looks like you know the the whole nine yards yeah. so yeah i dig and, i dig it it's an example of breaking written rules like the rule of thirds is not a rule of thirds it's a suggestion of thirds right 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 yeah. and and it creates tension when you're when you're when you're that close to the frame edge it creates tension um you know i would say experiment with this image and flip it horizontally mm. so that she's on the right side of the frame and the difference is the perception often is is that this is like her coming back from work you mean and flip it you, you mean flip it horizontally as in reverse it yeah okay. yeah so just flip it horizontally um so when when the subject is walking to the left they're walking into um the past kind of like it's mm -hmm. they're they're walking back yeah if you if you will but if you flipped it horizontally it would look like she's walking to something like yeah. like to work so to speak as opposed to coming back from work yeah yeah and that and you know in Western cultures, right? She's walking into yes. the past. Right? Well, yeah, because we in read other cultures from left where they right. in other cultures where they read from right to left or up to up to bottom, it you doesn't know, matter. It, it doesn't matter, right? As much, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, very cool. Love no, it. but try. I mean, try it. Flip it. You know, like just flip it horizontally and see how it, how it makes you feel. It's it's a it, it's an interesting uh, experiment. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. Good idea. See, I knew. Oh. I knew that you had substantive <laughs> feedback to answer. You know, to, to, ah. <laughs> you're getting over the derangement. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. So mean to me. I know. Well, Gavin Steiner, thank you so much for that. Yeah. All right. Last but not least is another one from Gavin Steiner. Awesome. Yeah. And he says, I've been obsessed with railroad signals and lighting since I was a very young kid. This is my first image of one. I may eventually do a series. He titles this one Level Headed. The camera was his EOS Rebel T6i. It was shot with an EFS 17 to 55 millimeter F28 IS USM lens at 21 millimeter. Shot wide open, aperture priority at 640th of a second F28 at ISO 100. Shot in Barrie, Canada. Let's take a look at this one. Look at that. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. I like it. I like it leaning a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I really particularly like the the tree line in the background mm. that adds a little bit to the bottom. I really do like that. I think that that sort of adds an element. It grounds it. Um, yeah. It grounds yeah. It. It grounds I like it. the vignetting on this as well. You know, so the, he, you know, clearly added a little bit of vignetting on this. So I, I, I yep. dig that to draw you right into the symmetry of that X in the middle. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's heavy-handed, but it it works really well for this image. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, heavy-handed heavy is okay for a vignette, you know. I mean, yeah, obviously not all the time, but sometimes you want to hammer it home that hey, viewer, I want you looking right here. <laughs> right? right, that's right, what a vignette right. is supposed to be for, right? Is look right here, not over there, right here. Right, right, right. and that's that's why we talk about where where things are in focus and where the bright spots are and composition. It's all about getting the viewer to look where you, the, the artist, <clears throat> the maker wants them to look. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Very good shot. Very good shot. We, uh, we should probably mention, at least I feel compelled to mention that, you know, railroad tracks are dangerous and they're private property. Yeah. And it's actually illegal to be on, on active railroad tracks. Not, not only is it exceedingly dangerous, uh, but you know, just be aware that when you're on railroad tracks, that's railroad property and it's trespassing. In some places, um, you can get arrested for that. It's oh, they, they can be that. really tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's because it is so dangerous. So when you see like you know shots of seniors on railroad tracks and things like that, it always makes me cringe. Um, there's been fatalities. Photographers have died. There was an instructor that that passed away. She got hit by a train. I mean, you just. Train train tracks are dangerous. They're super cool, yeah. and we all want to be on them, right? So just be really aware of where you're at. Wow. Yeah. Good. Very good advice. I had no idea. I knew obviously that they're dangerous, but I did not realize that they were private property, and in some places could get you arrested. So. Oh yeah, yeah. That the the railroad tracks uh, belong to the railroad. Yeah. So. Yeah. And we have a facility that I shoot at that has abandoned tracks in the back, mm -hmm. but I never post them socially. Because I just don't want people to see like, oh, Troy's shooting a bride on the tracks. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're abandoned tracks and it looks good in their album and they love them. But we just don't share those because I don't I don't want to perpetuate this idea that being on train tracks is is super cool. Yeah. 
Well, Gavin, I hope you were safe on these railroad tracks. I don't, I don't know. It doesn't even look like you were on the tracks, but, you know. Yeah. Yep. Definitely heed Troy's advice. Yeah, you want to um, yeah, be, be, safe. be especially vigilant when you're around giant objects that could be flying down those those tracks with very little warning. Uh, although you would have warning if you're taking a picture of this thing, which is designed to warn you <laughs> that the train is coming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So if this was blinking, yeah, stay, stay clear. Stay clear. Yeah. I, I've been out photographing in my area, um, and there's a commuter train that comes through this one area, and you cannot hear that train. You can't. I mean, it's, it could be right near you and you can't hear that train. It is so quiet. Really? So, yeah, you got to be electric really... train? Like, why is it so quiet? I, I, it's, I don't know. Like I mean, maglev? A... I know some of the maglev trains, the Shinkansen in Tokyo, which is their, one of their electric trains, um, or the maglev trains, you know, all you hear is wind when that thing no, goes there's by. No, a, there's a very famous loop out here called the Cajon Pass, and it's the Cajon Loop where, they, where the train actually loops over the top of itself. But one of the trains, one of the tracks is used for commuter tracks. So we go out there and we were photographing the, the big trains. And this train approached us and started passing us, and literally we, we barely heard it, didn't hear it. We were so preoccupied. It's not like a big locomotive is going to come through and you're going to hear it rumbling for 10 minutes. I mean, yeah. it was quiet. Wow. So it was very, it was, it was so scary that it was quiet. We're like, oh my gosh, we would not have heard that coming. Wow. So yeah, just be careful. Oh, well, well, cool. Good. I think that's a good note to end on, you know? Yeah. I want to, I want to make sure we're at about an hour on this one. So this is one of the longer ones. We had a lot of submissions to go through. So thank you everyone for submitting. This is uh, you guys are awesome. The, the Twit Pro community, I appreciate your involvement in the, and in, in keeping the action going and, and you know, what I've been seeing a lot inside of Twit Pro, which is why we built the dang thing was the, the interaction between the members in there. Oh, yeah. People talking to each other and helping and suggesting. And, you know, we even got people that are starting to write full on full blown articles in there are showing up. You know, Stephen, I'm talking to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, it's only going to get better as the community continues to grow. And, you know, the, the whole idea of Twit Pro, as you know, Troy, was to create a safe space you know, not to use a you know a zeitgeist term, but to create a safe space for people to come that, you know, which is the whole reason for this small monthly fee, right, is to keep out people that just happen by and, you know, type out some vitriol and press send and go on about their day. You know, because there's a fee associated with Twip Pro, with Twip Pro people that come in tend to be a little bit more serious, which is what we wanted. A lot, yeah. And and very and and very willing to help and share. There's not a lot of uh, uh, protectivism yeah. that's going on. Like everybody wants to be like, hey, this is how I did it and Yep. Yep. Good yep. Stuff. That's a great thing. Yep. It is a good thing. All I right, man. It. Uh so we're done. Uh any final final parting thoughts you'd like to share with the Twit Pro community before we end this one? Um, no, other than I'm looking forward to having you come down and, and be our keynote speaker at F64 Live. Can't wait for that. And there's going to be some cool videos and interviews and yeah. stuff that's going to come out of that. that yeah, we're going to have a blast. The, we're going to have yeah, a blast. Yeah, the Twip Pro group gets to see. So, yeah. yeah. You and I were, I, I shared what the theme of my keynote talk was with you. I love it. Yeah, I love it. I'm not yeah. going to reveal it, but <laughs> yeah. It, uh, yeah, I mean, the whole thing is I want to keep, I want to keep it un- Right. So yep. unconference, unkeynote, unconventional is where we're going with this. So I think it'll it'll be excited. And there's yep, been a be lot fun. of buzz around F64 Live. Like I was telling you, we were chatting um, on Messenger back and forth the other day. A lot of the people that I have conversations with have been bringing up F64 Live. So you're you're stirring up the pot a little bit there, yeah. Mr. Uh, Troy Miller. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping. I'm hoping. That's my goal. Uh huh. Your derangement syndrome is catching on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. All right, man. Thanks a lot. And uh, I guess we'll see you next time. All right. You got it. Yep. All right. Take care. See you soon. All right. Peace. This is Twitter.